Oh man, what is it, Tuesday? Late Tuesday. Not late. Late for me to be doing this. Just got back from Vancouver. I swear to God, I live in a vehicle driving sometimes. <laughs> when had the, uh, got the, we had to go over to uh, another grad, graduation gather. Met a lot of new people. And a uh, quick note. Um, so we met some very fine human beings. I mean, fine human beings. Very intelligent, aware, kind, honest, brave, intelligent human beings. And it's funny, I, um, how am I going to say this? When you get amongst, surround yourself with positive people, the energy changes and changes everything in you. It makes you, it can make you almost be in a bit of a frenzy in a way. When you're communicating, telling stories, going back and forth and listening and speaking and listening and speaking and, and, uh, it's almost, it, it can be explained as almost exciting in a way to meet new human beings and listen to their journey so far. And especially if they're, if they are a positive energy, then it combines and it just, it's like a, it's like a cooking, it's like a crackling fire, good fire, right? It, it burns bright and positive. I'm really tired. Maybe that's a bit of a weird babble, but. It's something that's been in my head while we're traveling home is how I, it, when you meet people who are uh, higher vibration, you really notice it. And I have unfortunately had a lot of negative vibration around me for some time. And, um, and uh, it's, it's very refreshing to have a positive vibration around your positive energy. So what I'm saying is when you get the chance, if you recognize it, you can, be sure to surround yourself in positive energy and try to create positive energy yourself. It's very contagious and when it finds other positive energy sources it's like a freaking high energy party where no alcohol or anything is needed to get that high. It's a really good thing and that's what I just did for a couple days straight. It's really good. I also feel like I was at a talk-a-thon for a week too. Not a bad one. But anyway, now I'm home. And while the Coming home, chaos goes on inside. I get to hide in the little man cave here and have my moment with all my friends and share knowledge and listen to voices, which I love. So I'm going to get right into it and listen to this. This is titled, Looking for Something Specific. Hello, Steve. I've read to you before because I trust you and most of your listeners. Thank you for being kind and patient. These traits appear to be natural to you in a way that makes me a bit self-conscious. I think you do yourself proud. Thank you for the kind words. I just listened to today's share, 09 June 23. A lady sailor described Sabe's hair much like the way I would have, but I thought orangutan, orangutan, it's not orangutan, it's orangutan, right? Instead of our setter. What I saw was extremely clean and shiny looking, stunning. I did not see much and the circumstances were not dramatic in the Sabe's experience way, but, like many others have stated, the visual memory has been etched in my mind for more than 40 years. Better than, better than images that should be extraordinarily important. I believe that they purposely set the images. In the past, I have emailed you in order to challenge you to look at some things in a different way. I hope that I do not aggravate you. I'm truly thankful for the opportunity that you provide. I figured that if you are going to read something that I wrote, that you should be able to use my name. Since hearing you share, I've told several people my stories. I get different responses. The same dim-witted people that believe the mainstream media are the ones who have the worst responses. I have been amazed with a couple of people opening up with stories of their own. Within the aforementioned share, the lady also stated the color of the eyes and the shape of the pupils. I too saw the eyes as deep yellow, almost golden look where we have our whites. She described the pupils as being like a cat's slit. I did not see a slit. I now wonder if I saw what was in between. Let me explain. I'm at the point of wondering if the yellow slash golden eyes people see are what you get when the light is bright that the pupil can be so small that you do not see it, or it is a slit. You see in the eyes, 
You see in the eyes I saw, the part of the eye that would fill the area of our pupils and corneas was bright scarlet with a distinctive shape. I've been waiting to hear someone else describe the shape I saw. This would need to be very close up or through optics. I've been wondering if we see bright red slash scarlet eyes when it is dark. The darker, the redder. I've also been wondering if their eyes have more than one mode. Characteristic, characteristics like ours, dogs, even eagles. Do they see with normal light vision, infrared slash night vision, and variable fields of view? I don't want to just repeat knowledge that I've heard in your shares, so I'll not repeat what we've all heard before. I travel across the United States fairly often. After learning, after learning when I am being greeted by Sabe vocally, I find that I receive a greeting soon after I arrive on either end. At first I thought they did this just for me, but recently my wife made a round trip without me and received a greeting on each end. I'd like to know if anyone else has this experience. Again, thank you for being an aware human spirit. Best regards, Jeffrey Snyder. Okay, Jeff, we'll see what comes from the comment section below. We'll see, and I believe what he meant, if anybody's not picking up what he put down, uh, being greeted on either end. So they're long haul drivers, and they're being greeted when they arrive, and greeted by some kind of sound when they get home is when I'm picking up what you're putting down there. But we'll see. I've been too much thought myself into the eyes and how they work or the whys about the eyes because I am still my my personal ride. I am more still on the why are we being lied to kick is what where is what is driving me. Why are we being lied to? What are we being lied to? Why doesn't I just had this conversation with my new friend in Vancouver last night. And he enjoys this topic and is interested in it and follows a lot of the videos here. And he said, I was explaining to him, I'm like, why my concern is more of that than it is about the eyes or the foot or the, the mid-tarsal breaks or um, what have you. I don't really care at this point. It's been done a million times. We get it. they got a different foot, a different build. They walk differently. They look differently. Their eyes glow without reflection. We know that. And they have a whole bunch of skills that we don't have that freak us out. Accepted. Moving forward. One of my main concerns, what I think about more is, and wonder about a lot, is... Let's say uh, Mr. Johnson took his family, children, young family, to that lake over the park. And uh, they had a terrifying experience with something that roared so loud it shook their ribcage, made them paralyzed with fear they couldn't move. Then they saw something that was around 10 feet tall, 800 pounds, covered in hair, and it scared the living shit out of them. He actually poss possibly um, developed severe PTSD. And basically almost no one's there to help them, coach them through what they experienced. And But even worse is... There's no one to share that honest knowledge and experience they had so that when Mr. Smith comes along with his family the following next couple days, poor Mr. Smith does not have even half of an opportunity. He doesn't have a choice whether or not he may want to go to that same place with his family, young children, and kick the ball and throw it in the bush and slingshots and possibly expose them to that same terrifying, life-changing terror, potentially, and he doesn't have a choice. And that's bullshit. I know I'm going on a bit of a battle, but it's an important one, I feel. And that is one of the main serious things that I feel are very serious. And um, another reason, that's another factor that keeps me driving forward doing this, I'm not going to stop. Because of the Mr. Smiths and the Mrs. Smiths and the uh, that do not have the choice of possibly exposing themselves or their children to this at that same place where it just went down two days previous. That's not fair. That's a major penalty. Right? So, so there. So I guess I'm saying that to show you that if I don't share much interest in the eyes as you at this point, that's why. But somebody else probably does and somebody might know and help you little comment in the section in the comment, the comment section below, right? There you go. I might not show or react the way some people hope I do with a lot of shares, but that is why. That's why. Do I want to do more, more about these beings? Sure I do, for sure. 
but more I want I want the people of the world to know the truth. I'm really driven to share truth, discover truth, and share it and scream about truth from the top of a mountain as much as I can is what I'm about here. Now, possible insight and reply is the title of this next email. I'm currently watching your video, Hard Facts, about the Sabe or Sasquatch people being revealed. In this video, you went on a rant about how most artists depict Sasquatch as more like a gorilla. We haven't discovered yet. I apologize that I'm not a good writer, so please bear with me. Caps lock. This email is not to attack you. Period. <laughs> I absolutely love you and your channel and what you do. And a huge thank you to you for trying to get the information and truth out there. Alright. Now. I'm writing this to you to address the depictions of artists making them look more gorilla-like than human. From all the stories I've heard on your channel, sorry, from all of the stories I've heard on your channel, blank blank channel and blank blank channel, there are more than one type of Bigfoot. It seems, and I'm certainly no expert, nor is anyone else, that there are at least four to possibly twelve different species of Bigfoot. It is possible that some species do look more like, more gorilla-like, while others look more human. I do agree with you on the fact that artists should be more open in their depictions slash art and show more than one type. Okay, I've said what I wanted to say, so I won't write a book. <laughs> Sorry I don't have an account to share, but if I ever do have anything happen, I will most certainly write into you first, then probably these other channels. You can share my name, Capricia Tyner, North Carolina. If you happen to choose to share this in one of your videos, again, thank you so much for what you do. Keep up the great work, love, light, peace, and many blessings to you, your family, your friends, and all of our fellow truthers out there. Sincerely, Capricia Tyner. Gotcha. Okay, appreciate your email. And yeah, sometimes I can get somewhat frustrated, only because um, for me I am probably a little too aware of the various people out there who are intentionally playing a role in keeping all of you going in a circle, which leads nowhere, right? And one of our strong patterns that are that come that is present when it comes to looking into this truth is um, quote it looked way more like a man than anything else end quote, and that is shared here probably I don't have a clue so I'm not keeping numbers but I would guess I don't know what do you guys think 97 percent of the time the people's the people who the experiencers share openly and honestly the fact that quote it looked way more human than it did not human not a gorilla but more human than not right so the majority of the drawn artists renditions are over exaggerated emotion Rah! you know a, an angry gorilla or an angry chimpanzee and you can almost take the face of those depictions and put them over the top of a chimpanzee or the movie star King Kong or a silverback gorilla and it fits perfectly and that's probably the majority what I've noticed it's the majority of the artist depictions are done that way and that's frustrating but they don't, possibly, I would imagine, the majority of those artists do not hear all of the people here. And if they did, <laughs> then I'll bet you they would, they would uh, change their, their uh, artistic um, flavor. Harvey Pratt, it's Harvey Pratt, right? Isn't that uh, Dave Plass's friend, the uh, forensic artist, artist from the Hooper Reservation? And he is probably the one who has... Um, done the forensic drawings based on eyewitness accounts probably the most accurately for certain google them up harvey pratt check out his shit it's very very good and believe me not too many artists even come close to the images that he creates and shares do 100 percent direct from descriptions babbling <laughs> all right here we go here's another one my experience hello steve this was my experience. All right, here we go. I was at a family member's home in the Weston's Mills, New York area, where I also hunted many times in the woods 
behind this property for years. Excuse me, this is located in Cataragas, Cataragas, is that a name? C A T T A R A U G U S, Cataragas County in southwestern New York, about 15 miles from the Allegheny National Forest. I had stepped from my mother's residence next door to my brother's home to let their dog outside to potty. I waited just outside the door on the concrete slab leading to the driveway for it to finish. It was early morning, it was 7 a.m. and autumn. The weather was overcast and cool. Suddenly an immense huge scream let loose from the woods behind the property and rattled me to my core. The dog that was the dog that was another 40 yards from me, sniffing the grass, about to do its business, streaked past me like a rocket, terrified and nervously waited to get in the door while I was only four feet away from this door, also grappling with the doorknob to enter quickly. I really didn't think I spent much time in the woods after that hunting whitetails because I did hunt alone. That scream still haunts me today. It was no puma. However, there is one that lives in these woods. Just letting you know that I know the scream of a puma, and this is no puma. I've not heard it since. The entire valley shook with the immensity of this scream. Thank you for offering a platform for folks like me to speak out on this topic. I enjoy your channel. I also follow Scott Carpenter, Dave Plattis. I've witnessed the I have witnessed the iridescent shimmering twice in the big woods as I've hunted in the hills and large rock outcroppings and caves in the Allegheny, in Allegheny, New York. That was three miles from the National Forest, but it only passed me silently as I hunted. I no longer wander these areas. Thank you. Barbara Bosser. Bosser. Sorry if I butchered your last name, Barbara. I appreciate you taking your time to share with us what you experienced and where it was. And I will bet you somebody is going to chime in from there without a doubt it's, it seems to go it's the way it goes people chime in share on here with all you through me I rattle off where it is boom people are already listening from that area because there's more than that one experience right and then the, here comes the emails here's another one this title well I'd hope it was just kids but I was wrong said a lot of people Mr. Steve, watch your channel because I had a few things happening I couldn't put my finger on. Then a few that scared the crap out of me. I'm no badass, but that's not real easy to do. I don't watch TV, though I have one note. Do I normally stuff a bunch of nonsense or negative stuff? What? I don't watch TV, though I have one note. Do I normally stuff a bunch of nonsense or negative stuff? In short, I watch your channel, and at first thought kids were having fun at my expense until a few things happened that no kid or adult could pull off. So, I put up a couple commercial grade cameras, and it calmed down, but it didn't go away. Since I hit about seven red flags in the assessment, I decided to look up what the history was in my area. I didn't have to. Rec I didn't have. I didn't have two recent act activity as close as last June. Okay, there's some typos here. Okay, you guys, these are first time reads for me. I'm, you guys, we're all here together, all right? I didn't have, let's just say, I didn't have recent activity as close as last June. This thing could have bagged me up in a breath and hasn't. My worry is, some Yahoo is going to shoot it. But after four years, I got one blurred shadow across my front DR one time driveway and I don't think it can be shot and I'm glad it scared me but it didn't hurt or kill me out of the seven or so times or red flag moments I agree it far outclasses us and if it meant to hunt us we would be toast before we knew what hit us I think it's around still and means me no harm maybe they have kids and they're Kids are like ours. Kids will be kids. I have questions, but don't want to make this a two-page email. I guess the one thing that still messes with me is the sound on my is the is the sound on my trailer had to be eight feet, but the blurred image I did see at 
dusk, but still full light, would have been 500 pounds, but was no two legs, it was no boar, and all the rest of the stuff lines up with things I've, I, I've heard on your shares. Brother, no crap, it's a lot different living it in person. I sit, still blown away by the whole thing. At first, it definitely added to the stress factor in my life. I'm on property, get away from most of the poop that's out there. Or, bad things are people. I think I'm finding peace with this, because you're right. I've been gone. I'd been gone before I knew what hit me. Peace, brother. I'd like to share the whole thing with my brother one year older. Not sure if he would believe all of it. So wish me luck. I hardly could believe it. And then, with all the crap I've had to deal with outside of this, why me? I've n I have known, want to see what had been happening with me, and yes, I have more details. But I'm just trying to cope, not prove anything. It's still near, but I think it's decided I'm no threat. Like I could be. One last thing. Something had attacked my pets over the years, so I went out with a pipe made of made a noise and smacked a big old oak near my trailer, thinking that'll scare a bobcat or a coyotes, never thinking about anything else. Like I said before, I have a big TV, haven't turned it on in a few years, didn't like some of the trash I heard or seen, and didn't ever look up Sabe until four years, I guess, of red, of red flag moments. Wow, glass not trying to give my old ass a stroke anymore. Let me know if you want the whole details, and I'll write back. Most of you have mentioned. My question is, can any of the other stuff out there be tied to it? Or can it really shapeshift? Because even for an unknown, this thing has been able to do to move and do shit that should be flippin' impossible for anything. And no, man, I'm not a nut. Paul Meyer. Past carrier was electric card access, large CCTV for plant stuff on other low voltage system integration. Thanks. Okay, man. This is a little awkward, Paul, but we got it. So, um, I hope you're doing alright. If you're still here watching this channel, which I think you are, um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people that do want to hear all the details, so if you can, hammer it out. Proofread it. Get a friend to read it and send it on over, all right? And we'll share. You got something, you got some knowledge in there, you got some details you want to share. Share it here. It's a safe place to do it. And so far, nobody's been hurt from sharing here that I'm aware of. Hello, Steve. I hope this finds you and Sarah well and in good health, as well as the rest of your family and friends. My wife and I had a fishing charter with you August 22. Yes, you did. I hope you're keeping a lookout for my tooth, <laughs> lol. It was an awesome experience with you. You're good people. As I have stated in my first email, okay, hold on a minute. So this great couple came out from back east, and uh, he had a false tooth, and he was over, over side the edge of the boat and lost his tooth. <laughs> and I was saying how, uh, we had a good little chuckle over, but I was saying how I'll try to, I'll look in the stomachs of every fish, fish I catch for the rest of the summer and see if maybe we get lucky in it. A fish ate his tooth, but no luck so far. <laughs> I hope you keep it a lookout for my tooth, LOL. It was an awesome experience with you. You're good people. As I've stated in my first email, Canadian's Ice Road Trucker in Alberta, I've had many interactions with these humanoid beings since I was 10 years old. I'm 56 years old, and knowing what I know now, which is basically nothing on the big scale of things, it is still very difficult to go back to that first encounter. It was March break, 76, in Ontario, Canada, and this took place in Algonquin Provincial Park. Myself and 13 other Cub Scouts from all across Ontario were up on the park to get our orientation badge, snowshoeing badge, fire building badge, etc. It was a beautiful time to be in the park. I got to see all the animal tracks and had to experience a small scale maple and got to experience a small scale maple syrup production the whole the whole way the old way, LOL. Long story short, on the third day. We were broken up into seven pairs of scouts 
and each of us not knowing the other from a whole other troop from Ontario. Our age group was 10 to 12 years old. We got to know each other for the first two days. And we had partnered up on our own. Some of us had a natural friendship with each other. So I'm so going into this, my partner, whose name was David, was from Oshawa, Ontario. We got along really good, both being big for our age and strong. As you know how boys are, a little competition between each other. And this morning we were going to try for our orientation badge, which consisted of a loop of approximately six miles on an old portage road, about three and a half feet of snow, unmolested from human tracks or snowshoes or activity. David and I were the third team to go. We left 10 minutes apart and were timed when we left, so knowing this, we didn't hesitate on pushing ourselves with the task at hand. Everything was going good. It was a beautiful plus three overcast with light snow blowing almost like snow globe at times. Oh, like a snow globe at times, and sometimes not so much. We're in about the third mile mark, just inside of it actually. We climbed a hill that was probably 2,000 yards of a gradual grade, but nothing steep. As we topped the hill crest to the downside, we found the first two teams standing together in the trail, looking and pointing about 500 feet down, just before a turn to the right, with something dark, darting back and forth behind a tree. Now, we immediately noticed the concern on their face, but we were thinking, that's just a moose. And that was pretty cool. But as we started to look, we understood why they were concerned. Being 10 years old, we played a lot of hide and seek as kids, but we knew moose did not do that. They always ran away, but not this thing. It moved itself from view and reappeared 50 feet away, peeking at us again. I had that same shit happen to me. At this point, we're all scared, but we knew someone but we knew someone could be playing a joke on us and come in from the other way of the loop. But this was just too big and too tall. We never got a real good look at it. It being about 500 feet away, we had no binoculars. Only our scout leader, Brad, age 18, had them with him, and he was behind us, bringing up the rear teams. Unfortunately, when Brad arrived, he acted like most, he acted like most adults and immediately started giving us hell about screwing up our times and the exercise of the day. When he did notice how scared we were, he asked us what was going on, and we all pointed down the trail and said we believe there is a moose down there, or we're not going to go any further. This was followed by an immediately scarfing from Brad, determined to be the fearless leader, put the binoculars he had on this thing. Welcome Brad to the club and a return. He immediately started shaking and trembling and uttering the words, We've got to go. We've got to go now. We all listened as he said, let's get back to the cabin as quickly as we can and leave no one behind. He didn't indicate what he's seen. And we all seen him terrified. And we were terrified as well. And we're going to follow him no matter what. We were just over three miles from our remote cabin. And we had four hours of daylight left. We started out and never looked back. That was the longest three miles of our young lives. I don't remember anything on the way to the camp, other than everyone's breathing and the odd whimper. No one complained, and we all pushed through as a team, and we finally arrived at the cabin about a, with about an hour's daylight left. Brad regained some of his composure, but he was obviously still scared and in shock from what he'd seen. We asked what it was, and he said he didn't know. And don't ask again but let's get prepared for the night. And we will snowshoe out first thing in the morning. We were instructed to get enough firewood to do a week, if we had to, and yes, this terrified us. The wood pile is about 120 feet from the cabin. Shit, I think I read this, didn't I? I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. It consisted of maple and birch and the odd black spruce. Most of it was split, although there was some round ones about five inches across, approximately five to eight pounds each piece. We worked as a team, and we got this done. We were instructed to put the winter covers on the windows, which are facing the wood pile, and the door. Well, we got inside and got a great big fire going to keep us warm. Brad could not let us cook anything. Sorry, Brad would not let us cook anything. And that concerned us as well. 
He said, I know you all have chips and chocolate bars, so eat them up, because we're not cooking on the fire tonight. We proceeded to start the longest night of our young lives. Now, I'm not afraid to tell you, a lot of us kids had soiled themselves because of this unreal, terrifying, life-changing experience. The outhouse was on the other side of the woodpile, lol. That sucked, but we're already soiled. Shit, this is brutal, that's brutal. About 10 p.m., the first roaring started. We were hoping this was a wolf, but due to the vocal range and the changes in length and pitch, we were certain it wasn't a wolf. And the look on Brad's face told us he knew it wasn't a wolf as well. We had no lights on, only a glow of fireplace. We were all on the floor together, hand in hand, some of us praying and some of us crying for our moms. This was beyond terrifying as the screams continued closer and closer and stopped around 2 a.m. Now, none of us was sleeping, and Brad was a total wreck, almost incoherent and muttering. We got a short break from this activity, and then around 3 a.m., just when we thought we were going to make it, that's when the boom started. Now, if you're familiar, as I know you are, with a 12-gauge shotgun, particularly a pump action, there was three booms with a pause in between. That's the only way to describe it. And it made a vi it and it made a vibrated of the walls, probably a vibration of the walls of the whole cabin. The walls were actually moving with each boom. We were absolutely terrified. As a little kid, desperation, panic, fear, and wanting your mom, it's so very hard to go back here for me. But I know now I have accepted and faced this fear. I don't know how long this this lasted as being that scared. It can take away the time and memory. I myself was woken up by Dave at daylight. I was confused and shocked by being woken up. I truly do not remember even trying to sleep at all. I can say I was not alone because others were sleeping as well. My only thought is that the fear was so intense we all blacked out. We made sure everyone was all right, and we proceeded to talk with Brad about our exit plan. And this is pretty simple. Get the snowshoes on and get back to the main campground, and that was three miles away, and he said, don't turn back. Well, it took, it took us approximately 30 minutes to get the courage to start out with the plan to leave this, the cabin, and as we tried to open the door, there was a firewood blocking the door. We had to push through the firewood to get outside. And on the end, on the side of the cabin wall, was, and the side of the cabin wall was all smashed in like someone took a sledgehammer and beat on the old logs. We could not understand what we were seeing. There were no tracks but ours. What the F, right? There's approximately a full cord of firewood laying all around the side of the cabin facing the woodpile. Brad and David and myself and a couple others walked towards the woodpile until we found a huge human-shaped five-toe tracks which weren't a whole lot smaller than some of our snowshoes. The footprints was beside the woodpile about 120 feet from the cabin door. So we understood as 10 year olds how much power it took to launch the firewood like missiles at the cabin. It's truly amazing what fear can do to a body so young. And it's also amazing how your body will naturally react in a situation like this. Call it a miracle. Or just your fear and willpower. We all turned and headed towards the main cabin that was three miles away. I'd never seen anything. I never heard anything other than my own heartbeat pounding in my head and my breathing and the other 13 scouts breathing and whimpering once again. As a team heading towards salvation, that was more scarier than the three mile snowshoe the night before as we seen the tracks. Absolute shocking fear. Well, we all made it back to the main camp and much to the surprise of the head counselor in charge of the camp, he was wondering why we were so early. It didn't take him long to assess something was terribly wrong. We were told to take a knee as Brad went into the main cabin and briefed the counselor of our experience. Only a couple of us tried talking about the tracks as only a few of us seen them, but everyone was still in shock. 
and still scared. Brad emerged an hour later informing us that our parents were called and was on the way and that this was a wildlife encounter with an early spring bear and nothing more. And sometimes this happens in the bush. When my father arrived to pick me up, he asked what happened and all I could say was, I don't know, but it scared us so bad and they canceled the rest of the week. And he said, you also smell like shit, lol. No doubt. I never stayed in contact with anyone from this experience, and all I can tell, it changed my life, and no doubt everyone else's. I let this fear get the best of me, the best of me most of my life, but not anymore. Anyway, I'd just like to say one thing. I am now more curious than ever about this being, and let me point out, I am still afraid. No matter how many times you have this experience, and if you're not afraid, you're full of shit. Sorry, just my thought. Take from what you will. One last thing, Steve, I'd like to say. We as modern humans are no longer part of the natural world, but these beings have adopted, adapted to be masters of nature, no doubt. Best regards, a proud New Brunswick Canadian Mikey. Mikey, appreciate you, man. Thoroughly enjoyed meeting you and your wife and, and fishing, too. You put us right there, and that email also expresses easily the importance of, of sharing true knowledge with the community, with people we know. There's no reason not to. Not today. No more. Well, I don't want to sound like I want to sound like I sound crazy. It gives a shit. Our truth is crazy. This planet is crazy. There's absolute crazy insanity being drilled into the community and our children daily via these things or they're the TV screen, right? There is, there is nothing to be afraid of. You're not crazy. Who, how many people do you guys think know this truth today in the planet? Know it from first-hand experience or hearing it from someone they trust with their life, right? Who knows? I would, from the sheer number of people coming here, and I don't have that big of a reach. I mean, there's people out there who have reached out to Millions and millions and millions of people non-stop. I mean, there's somewhat millions here, but when it comes to the global population, we're, we're just a speckle, right? But as common it is to hear from people about these experiences here, I don't know, what do you guys think? Over a million people? Is there possibly over a million people alive today on this planet who, who know this firsthand as truth? I wouldn't be surprised at all now. Not now. I wouldn't be surprised at all if that was the number plus. Anyway, I'm beat. I'm so beat. I'm tired. I'm done. Now I'm relaxed. I got some more voices heard. And uh, keep coming, Mikey. Um, I'm, I would imagine some of your friends you are with when you were a kid are here listening. I put money on it. I wonder if they're going to email us too. And uh, now the fishing topic, too. I know I haven't mentioned it too much, but yeah, there's some days available for July, August. And I just keep my mouth generally kind of shut about it because I have to wait for our, what's it called? It's like a lottery draw. You put in your ticket, you pay for it, you put in for draw hunts in British Columbia, and hopefully you get them. I've been really trying to get the Vancouver Island elk draw. Didn't get it. So now I'm actively, rapidly making my plans for this fall. I think I have committed to myself that I am going to fly in my red little red Zodiac motor generator, my Starlink internet, tons of fuel, a full camp, and I am going so remote, it's going to be ridiculous. And I'm going to stay there a long time. And I'm going to uh, hike up a mountain, hopefully get a mountain sheep. And I'm going to hike and hunt around a lot, see things, do things, share with you guys whenever I can, maybe even go live from that remote. That's going to be crazy. And uh, also bring home a monster moose. So that's my plan, that's what I'm doing, and that's why I haven't mentioned the fishing, what I'm getting to. So, yes, I can do some more days. I already have people booked for sure for July, August, but I got some days left. So I'm saying for all the people out there who may want to go, for salmon and halibut, um, just email bookit at howtohunt.com and Sarah will be in touch with that, right? Salmon and halibut, July, August, not September. I'm out of here. What else? I think that's about it for now. But tomorrow morning I have a lot a lot of voice to be shared tomorrow morning. And uh, I'm going to keep the ball rolling and I'm going to go back out to the coast pretty quick and I'm going to spend a handful of days out there doing all sorts of crazy shit. And I'm going to share it all with you guys. 
and I'm going to talk to more people. And then uh, soon, hopefully, if I get a few days, I'm going to go back to the coastal mountains and I'm going to hook up with a bunch of my friends there, friends that I know are here watching me. I won't say your names yet, but I'm going to find you guys and we're going to sit on front of this camera. We're going to bullshit. We're going to talk about the truth, the truths, which have been going around the mountains and forests between Squamish and Mount Curry and Lillooet. And we're going to talk to people who have lived there for generations and they're going to share with us truth, right? That's coming up too. Share my story at howtohunt.com. That's how you can get your truth out to a lot of people here right now currently. There you go. No more battle. I gotta go. I'm done. I'll be back shortly.